It's national meets regional. Welcome to Sidewalks Entertainment, the long-running celebrity, music, and art series. Join us now for an exciting new path to celebrity interviews, music, rising talents, and much, much more. In a minute, we're actually going to catch up with the director, Michael Cuesta, who sits down to talk to me about his film, Kill the Messenger, about a real-life journalist, Gary Webb. But here is a clip. Dangerous. What you found here, Gary, is a monster. You have no idea what you're getting into. Are you really telling me that I should just walk away from this? You'd be an idiot not to. This story scares people. I'm your big brother. Well, it should. Be careful. There are ongoing operations you're in danger of exposing. We know you were in Nicaragua. Am I being followed? Find a solution where you be for the revolution. I thought my job was to tell the public the truth, the facts, pretty or not, and let the publishing of those facts make a difference in how people look at things, at themselves, and what they stand for. We'd never threaten your children, Mr. Webb. What'd you say? It's over. I'm not finished with it. I'm not finished. This is a true story. Some stories are just too true to tell. If you could kind of just give us a quick premise of the film for our viewers. A quick premise. Yeah. Well, it's you about a, a, a. It's about a, a, you know, a really kick-ass rock and roll, sort of dogged Doberman-like investigative journalist that uncovered one of the biggest stories of the of, of the late 20, 20th century. Mm -hmm. And the story is that he uncovered is that the CIA was in business with drug dealers during the Contra War. Reagan's admin Reagan administration lost funding for the war, so they needed money to fund the war. Obviously, we had Iran Contra. They sold illegal arms. They f diverted those funds to the Contras. But what people don't know, or most people don't know, is the Contra cocaine connection, where a lot of drug dealers. The CIA was looking the other way and allowing drug dealers who were exiles from Nicaragua to send money back from their drug sales to fund the war. Right. And a lot of those drugs ended up on our streets. And, we, and our government didn't do anything about it. Right. What intrigued you to do this, this film? And you know, what was it that, how did you hear about the story? Well, no, the script was brought to me. I was the last one to come on board because okay. the script was around since 2007. It was adapted from Gary's book, Dark Alliance as well as uh, Nick Scow's book, Kill the Messenger. It was adapted by Peter Landisman. And uh, I, when I read the script, I remembered the story breaking in the 90s and seeing Gary on, uh, on I think it was Montel Williams. And I knew the controversy of it. And I remember you know, the, uh, that he was challenged, but I didn't, by, by other journalists, but I didn't know to what extent. Yeah that he was discredited. Yeah. And when I read the script, and then when I started, when I read the books, um, I was just amazed and appalled that he, that he had to go through this. Yeah. Um, and I saw it as an injustice, and it was unfair. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Gary was an amazing reporter, an imperfect guy, yeah. you know. Um, but uh, uh, I just felt like it was a, a necessary uh, film. Yeah. To, be, to, to get out there, and um, I've taken on a, f a few controversial subjects before, so yeah. it, it felt like it made sense. Well, and it's interesting that you did bring this topic up, because a lot of journalists nowadays, I mean, I mean for a long time, they've put, they're, they're risking their lives to get the story. Mm -hmm. And it's, I'm really glad that you actually told this story and got it out there, because not a lot of people know what journalists, what we journalists go through to, to get the story, yeah. in, in a sense, yes. you know? Yeah. So um, thank you for, for making this film. And I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, did you feel a, kind of a, a responsibility to tell the story of Gary? And um, I mean, I think it's, yeah, if you get onto Gary's shoulders, there is a responsibility. Um, I think it's responsibility to, the, to just in journalism to sort of support other journalists, mm -hmm. people who do investigative work and I think the problem is is that Gary what he tapped into on this story was too too uh, controversial yeah you know it was too controversial for 
the other papers, the bigger papers, to really dig too deep because they have a bigger bottom line and they have relationships that they need to nurture and keep at the CIA and in Washington. And a smaller paper like, you know, the Merck doesn't have that. So they were able to take the chance. Was the government aware that you were smuggling tons of cocaine into the United States? Yes, the government knew. This leads to very sensitive national security matters. National security and crack cocaine, the same sentence. Does that not sound strange to you? I'm going to tell you the whole truth. I'm going to introduce you to people you should talk to. And then you will be faced with the most important decision of your life. Oh, yeah? What's that? Deciding whether to share it or not. Sidewalk, theme song, and additional music produced and performed by Gerald Orsino. Visit her at her website at GeraldMusic.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Sidewalk TV. I'm Veronica Castro, and here with me is director, filmmaker, Michael Cuesta. Thank you for joining us on Thanks for having me. (laughs) On this lovely day in San Francisco. Um, First off, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what kinds of films you used to watch when you were growing up. What were... Kind of you know, I, uh, my, I uh, grew up uh, I was a young teenager in like the late 70s, so uh, very much 70s movies, you know. Um, uh, referring to this movie, uh, All the President's Men, uh, another Alan Bakula film, The Parallax View, all of Scorsese's work, um, Kubrick, um, Cassavetes. John Cassavetes. Um, my father uh, was a photographer as well. I was, but I sort of followed in his footsteps. And he always, uh, I guess, when he got stuck with us kids, my brother and I, who my brother and I actually write together, we're a writing team. Um, he would take us to these movies, like John Cassavetes movies, and um, uh, uh, I remember seeing Clockwork Orange. Maybe you shouldn't have taken me to see that. But, uh, it changed my life, and it made me want to make m- movies or do that or, or to create those, those kinds of images. That's right. And you're from the East Coast? New York. Yeah, okay. New York, yeah. Okay. So, Born in the Bronx, raised in Long Island, uh, went to college in New York City, and uh, live, I live in New York. That's crazy. So, but, I mean, it's a very... left. Yeah, and you're still there. Still there. Still there. Very, and it's a very artistic place, is New York. There's so much life and story that comes out of New York, I feel. So I feel like you have like probably a, a slew of things or ideas that you have for, for films. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, New York, it's a melting pot. So I was grew up around a lot of different kinds of people and cultures and things like that. So I, I like to think that that informed my aesthetic and my sort of way of looking at the world. Yeah, so I mean, you're saying here that your, your father kind of was an inspiration then for you to kind of go into filmmaking. Oh, completely, yeah. yeah. I mean, he took me to these movies, uh, took me to galleries, uh, mostly photography. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was also, I worked as an intern uh, when I was a teenager as a photojournalist okay. at a newspaper in Puerto Rico. Oh, right. Yeah, and uh, this one gentleman in particular was sort of my mentor, or almost a surrogate when I was sort of a teenager getting into a lot of trouble. <laughs> My father kicked me down to, uh, to Puerto Rico a couple of summers, places, and yeah. uh, a guy put a camera around my neck and said, you know, go, go shoot this story about cockfighting. And I went out, and they, they, these guys kicked me out and tried to steal my, ca- steal my camera, oh and my I almost got beat up. But, like, it's funny, I learned how to get the shot, how to, like, be fearless like that. Anyway, that led to to me becoming a photographer and then a filmmaker. Wow. And I didn't really get the bug to want to really make a film until I was in advertising and some music videos in the 90s when I started to uh, uh, do direct TV commercials and do artier commercials. I was uh, always experimenting in commercials. I didn't, um, they were always very visual. Mm -hmm. So I uh, started to, uh, I made a few short films because I didn't make shorts when I was in college. And failed and then made one that got into a few festivals and then I started to write my first feature. And then I made that, uh, you know, in a vacuum, you know. I just made it and sent it into festivals and it got into Sundance. And um, 
that sort of started all this. Yeah, you've and you've worked on several different television shows. Well, the TV, I never ever thought about working in tele television. I mean, commercials is a different thing. Working on, on a series, because my, you think of this 2002, 2003, like my view of television was like, this is like different. Was, was growing up was MASH and Columbo and just TV wasn't where if you were a filmmaker you would ever want to dabble in, you know, unless you came from TV or unless you were a TV writer, mm -hmm. which is what TV is really based in, is in the writer's room. And the directors usually are very much hired guns and they're not really filmmakers um, in the classical sense. But I think it's the advent of cable television that changed everything and I was lucky enough to be invited to guest direct on uh, Six Feet Under, Six on the ball feet. show. And that, uh, what Alan was doing was he was going to Sundance and finding independent filmmakers to come and direct different episodes because he wanted the piece to really feel very filmic and very, right. um, I mean, it almost had a Bergman-esque quality to it, if you remember the show. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it was a show about, uh, uh, about sort of deep ideas, you know. I uh, never saw that on television. Yeah. And I remember someone said, oh, they invited you to do this. You check out the show. I hadn't seen it. And then I watched the first season of it because I, I came in the second season. And I was like, wow, this is television? This is pretty yeah. amazing. So I went and did it. And since then, I worked, I was lucky enough then to, I was offered uh, the book Dexter was written. Dexter, that's and right. And then uh, Bob Greenblatt, who was running Showtime at the time, I met him on the set of Six Feet Under and we sort of got along. We talked about doing something and he, he offered me the, to direct the pilot. Wow. Yeah, and that was life changing because I knew when I was making that, I'm like, Sh you know, movies aren't even as good as this. Know. You know, it's like half a movie because it's 60 minutes long. Yeah. But it was so, like, what a bizarre character. And I had worked with Michael on Six Feet Under, so, you know, casting him in, in, in Dexter was, uh, yeah. was a lot of fun. But, um, it's it's interesting how television it's like it's literally like films like film on TV. So. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's HBO started that, and then of course Showtime. I mean, we were the first real series on Showtime to really break. Yeah. Um, so it started with that, and then I made my second film. Uh, I made another indie. You know, I couldn't get a studio film. I wasn't interested in the projects. Right, right, right. I was offered stuff, and most of them were just more commercial movies and. And I thought, well, if it's a paycheck, I might as well just do other do commercials or something. Right. So I stuck to just doing smaller, more personal work in yeah. the, in, 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 with films. For more full-length celebrity interviews, visit SidewalksTV.com.